when you talk about the West Memphis Three, there's a lot of uh, perspectives you could take, a lot of angles you could take on this. The psychological, the American justice, the rage and anger, the sociological, right, Velvet? Yeah. I mean, every uh, it, it, so many approaches. Why don't we just cover them all? But we only got 90 minutes. Actually, this is a special six-hour show. I meant to tell you. Oh, no. oh man. Awesome. <laughs> and we still won't cover everything. But look, we're not denying that anything happened in 1993 in West Memphis, Arkansas. Three young kids lost their lives. Their names were Steve Edward Branch, James Michael Moore, and Christopher Mark Byers. Our thoughts, sympathy go to their family. But we're here to talk about another injustice, and that is someone who paid for that crime that was another man's crime. And so I'm proud to have in our studio Mr. Jason Baldwin, West Memphis 3, but now he's part of ProclaimJustice.org. Welcome to Dallas, my friend. Thank you for having me. You're so right. welcome to be here, man. And to, to your right is Velvet. She, we are calling you our resident expert because you did your entire, well, you say it. Yeah, I did my college thesis on y'all, on the West Memphis Three case, and how mob mentality can really uh, make a case or break it. Um, it just depends if they think you're guilty or innocent, despite if you're really guilty or innocent. So I did my whole thesis around that and how the justice system can be swayed by media and, and stuff like that. So. On the entire case. Thank you. Right. Yeah, the entire the entire case yes. was definitely once they got tunnel vision on you three. It was done. Right. Because the media and all of that was behind it. So yeah, that was my whole thing about it. And and we'll talk about all that. Janie Slash, hello. Hello. You Hi. were rocking yesterday at Vulgar Fest. I'm, I'm sorry we don't have time to show a million pictures of that, but it's but okay, uh, what a cool what a cool event. So look, you talked about the press. Was this a also? Case? I'm in the chat room. Oh, okay. Yeah, uh, chat, question, we're live, so questions, comments, if you want to float them to the, the, the chat room, Jamie Slash will monitor that, uh, and certainly we'll watch that for any good questions, comments, and, and mention it. Yes. Was this, Velvet, Jason, was this a case that, that had TV talk shows going crazy at that time? Most definitely. It was at the tail end of the satanic panic. Which anybody who dressed differently or had alternative lifestyles was lumped into the Satanic Panic. Which, if you're not familiar with what the Satanic Panic was, it was actually uh, was a big thing in the early to late 80s. Where um, a psychologist actually uh, did a big, big study on all these children. And she kind of swayed her study into thinking these children had Satanic experiences through their family members and friends. And teenagers in the neighborhoods and this has been debunked since then because she coerced that out of them um but you know in a little town in arkansas all they care about is like the satanic panic they don't care if it's been debunked or, or whatsoever so at least nowadays with the technology we have and the how easy it is to google something on your phone mm -hmm. you can have a better understanding of what's out there even satanism itself is not what people think it is it was trial by talk show yes yep yep it, it was definitely um i want you to be nice and close here brother in the vacuum of facts you know the media has a job to do they just want to report the news what's going on and things like that and so you know during my case during the trial my attorneys were like hey don't speak to the media don't say anything to the media and for me like paul forwards like i know jason that when they ask you if you did this you want to tell them you did not do that because that's just what you want to do but you can't tell them anything you can't speak to the media and so if the media is only getting a story from the prosecution that's what they're going to give there to the go. people you know and and us as, as consumers of the news and, and the general public we don't know we don't know what happens all we we just accept what's given to us through the media and so when the media is not getting a story from both the defense and the prosecution from both sides then it's just one-sided and it most likely not to re not revealing the truth why didn't you get a fair trial why didn't any of the three uh, i Is think there there's an easy a lot way to, there's a long answer to that yeah there, there's yeah. a lot of reasons for that and um usually in, in in wrongful conviction and things like that it's usually people that cannot defend themselves that are fatherless that come from broken homes these are the people that that police get into the system like 
Maybe they had a small conviction or, or arrest or something. They, anytime there's an unsolved cat, they, uh, uh, crime, they pull out the hat of people that they have in the system. And usually people get put in that hat at a very young age. I got put in that hat at the age of 11. You know, we had just moved from Memphis, Tennessee to Marion, Arkansas. You know, my mom and my mom loved my stepfather, but he was an abusive alcoholic. You know, he's a real Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. So when she couldn't live with that anymore, she packed us up. We moved to her mother's in Arkansas. And so, you know, we left all of our friends behind and everything, and we made friends fast. My brothers and I did. I was 11. My little brother, Terry, my brother, Matt, was uh, just two years younger than me. He was nine. My youngest brother, Terry, was only seven. And so we made friends fast that summer. And so we played hide and seek. We swam in the lake and everything. And out in the middle of this soybean field was this old tin shed, right? And from what I gather, the kids have been playing there for years and years and years. Now, I don't know how long it takes a tree to grow. Mm -hmm. Does anybody know how long trees it take? It depends to... on the breed of tree. <laughs> yeah. Very scientific. Yeah. Yes, yeah. very scientific. Yeah. But yeah, it takes a long time yeah. usually, right, yeah. for, mm -hmm. for yeah. a tree to grow full grown. Well, outside this building, a tree began growing. Mm -hmm. And so much time had passed that the tree pushed the wall in. The tree lifted the roof up and for us it was like a treant you know from lord of the rings oh, yeah, if you're yeah. familiar with that you know yeah. 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 and so i mean this is what everybody was doing we we just moved out there all the kids were playing there so we'd climb the tree on the outside and then we'd climb the tree and we'd be inside and it was dirt floors and there were like um weeds and stuff growing in there and there was like these old cars and we would play x-wing tie fighters uh, uh, star wars i mean we just played in there every day because that's mm -hmm. what our parents said, dude, go out and play, yep. go have fun. Mm -hmm. The you good know, old and, days <laughs> where you could go out and actually play. <laughs> yeah. 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 And, and, until one day something happened that had never happened before. The, the front doors opened up and there was the police, you mm -hmm. know, and they took all of us, all the kids that were there. And there were probably like 12 or 13 kids in there playing, ranged in ages from seven. Maybe the oldest was 12 mm -hmm. or maybe even 13. At this shed in the field. Right. Okay. And... They questioned all of us, like, oh, who else, had, who else had played here, you know, as a kid? You know, did your old, like, they would ask our friends, did your older brother play there or did this other kid play there? So at the end of it, they had rounded up every single kid that lived there, that had lived there before, and were charging us all with criminal trespassing. And I remember I went to see my public defender, Mr. Montgomery, in, in, in West Memphis, and he's like, don't worry about this. He's talking to me, my little brother, Matthew, and my mom. He's like, don't worry about this. Y'all were just playing hide and go seek. No harm, no foul. It, we'll, the judge will throw it out. Don't even worry about it. Next thing I know, when we go to court, the judge is like, well, the prosecution, uh, John Fogelman of all people, said, uh, Your Honor, I recommend two years in the state reform school for everyone. Mm -hmm. That's all the kids. And some kids were just seven years yeah. old. Well, you now, were out playing. You were playing. You're doing your what you're supposed to be doing as a kid. told you to. Exactly. Go ahead. And when he said that, Mr. Montgomery, my public defender, well, he was everybody's attorney. He jumped up and said, Your Honor, I think it would do him some good. <laughs> right? That's crazy. That's when my mom jumped up and said, My sons aren't going to kids' prison. And they, the judge was like, Everybody come to the bench you know, the attorneys and stuff and my mom. And at the end of it, I had five years probation and a $500 fine. My little brother, Matthew, had five years probation and a $500 fine. Every kid had five years probation and a $500 fine. Now, our family, me, Matt, Terry, my mom, our whole Christmas budget was 100 bucks. Yeah. So that's five. Ten Christmases stolen right there. Mm -hmm. Never mind the Joneses that lived down the street that had five of their kids taken. You know, so that's how we got put in the hat. And that's how a lot of kids out here in America get put in that hat. As and then kids, on you, you, you had, can't defend yourself. You had a record. Have a record. Okay. Something so something more something. serious happened. They're looking at that list first. Yes. That's how they get your name to pull it out of a hat. And uh, what's so bad, you know, after that, 
the trailer park where I lived at, it was like the most poorest place in the whole West Memphis and Marion. And the West Memphis and Marion police, they only put one roadblock up together every weekend. And that was in front of our trailer park. There was one way in and one way out. So they preyed upon the people there because they know the people that they might have a little bit of money, they can pay a fine, but the, none of them can defend themselves, yeah. you know? And so I had a probation officer. My little brother had a probation officer. Everybody had a probation officer. And so as the years went by, I'd be in class and all of a sudden, the intercom would come on. It'd say, send ball into the principal's office. And you so had, you had to go talk to your, I had to go talk to my parole officer, my, my probation officer. And so the people who don't know what we were in trouble for, that we were playing on go seek, just know that everybody in that trailer park has a record. <laughs> everybody in that trailer park uh, must be bad, right? And so years later, when Damien moved to the trailer park, he wasn't out there. He didn't even have that record. He wasn't playing hide and go seek that day. He didn't even live there. But he fell in love with this girl that lived in what we call the doll houses, mm -hmm. you know, in Marion, because they were really big, nice houses and everything. And her name was Deanna. And Damien fell head over heels <laughs> in love with this girl, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. Head over heels. And her dad was like, he lives where? In the trailer park? No, no. Oh. My daughter is not dating anybody from that trailer park. And so he would call the school mm -hmm. and was like, hey, I don't care if he is holding her books and carrying them to class. They will not see each other, mm -hmm. you know, and mm -hmm. because of that prejudice, they, they felt like they could never see each other, you know, instead of him providing a safe environment for them to see one another, he forbid it. And that just made them want to see one another more. Mm -hmm. And until it got to the point to where the only way they could figure out to see one another was to run away. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so Damien ran away with Deanna. And of course, the police found them, arrested him. Yeah. And, and, and the police were sicked on him by her dad. So the police were not looking out for his best interests mm -hmm. at all. And so I, I don't know if you've ever been a teenager in love. <laughs> And, and, and something oh, yeah. and just mm -hmm. happens. No, it's you know? oh, oh, yeah. <laughs> Been there. I mean, it, it breaks you, right? And, and so that's what Damien went through, this terrible grief, this terrible injustice, you know? And, and he's in this, this place with these people that have control over his life that do not have his best interest mm -hmm. at heart. And so that's how Damien got a record. Were you friends with him? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right. Um, I think in his book he wrote the first time he saw me was in study hall. He's like, there's some little kid over there with a black eye. And that was me. My stepdad gave it to me, but anyway. No, it, we have a picture of you. Uh, this might be a high school picture of uh, with the Metallica shirt. Oh, that's, yeah. the, uh, that's the day I was arrested. Oh. Uh, June the 3rd, 1993. That's my last day of school for the 10th grade. Um, it was a Thursday. That's the Metallica Damage Incorporated shirt where it says on the back, honesty is my only excuse. But, uh, Appropriate. Yeah. <laughs> so um, then can we fast forward a little bit? I mean, how, speaking of a T-shirt, I, I mean, how much does did wearing black and wearing a metal band and admitting you listen to metal influence the charges? It, it influenced them quite a lot because that was... In, in the absence of finding who really committed the crime, the police were really scrambling, you know, because the pop, the public wants answers. You know, mm -hmm. we want to know who did this. Sure. And no one can imagine anybody killing three eight-year-old boys. You know, you yeah. just can't imagine that, no. you know. And so it's got to be something just over-the-top nefarious, over-the-top scary, you know. And so they're like... so the I'm sorry. It's got to be Satanism. And of course, at this time, uh, Damien had went through all of this grief with running away with Deanna. And he now he has a probation officer, but his probation officer wasn't the same one I had. It was this guy, Jerry Driver. And this guy hated Damien, hated everything about him. Mm -hmm. You know, the way he dressed, especially the way he looked, his name, his religion or, or interest in religion and stuff. And so... He was on a campaign against Damien. Like even after um, Damien got to come home yeah. from running away, mm -hmm. like he tried to enroll in school 
and, and go back to school because mm -hmm. he didn't want a GD. He wanted a high school diploma like, mm -hmm. like everybody else, you know. Jerry Driver came to the school and arrested him again. Mm -hmm. Said, you were near, you're too close to Deanna. Oh, gotcha. Sent him back to kids' prison. Um, you know? it, it is. I, I mean, Janie and I have been talking about this. And I mean, one question I kind of have. When did, when did, how were you impacted when you first heard the phrase satanic or satanic ritual abuse or satanic, you know, the word satanic labeled on you as a, or abuser or something like that? It was horrible. Um, I, I tell you what, I, I'm, from growing up, I'm used to dealing with adults who don't know any better, like my stepfather, who is an abusive alcoholic. You know, it, yes, this person is an adult. Yes, this person should know better, but it's not guaranteed that they know better just because they're an adult, right? Yeah. So I'm used to dealing with these types of adults. And so when I encountered that in the police department, I'm telling them where I was at on this day, and I'm telling them I'm innocent, but they re absolutely refuse to hear it. They won't even write it down. They're like, no, your friend has told us you did this. We know you did this. I'm like, who is this friend? Yeah. They're like, oh, you know, why don't you give us his name? And, and I could have told them your name, just yeah. guessing, and they yeah. would have arrested you right then, you know, right then. In Any other words, name, a I trick, guessed, I a trick guessed, to get a, a, a co-conspirator name that's what they you. do. They try to make you guess, and anything you guess, they're going to go get that person, too. This is why you never talk to the police. Ever. Get a lawyer mm -hmm. first. Get a lawyer. Yes. And so, but what, what I rested my hopes on is because, um, I don't know, y'all have watched crime shows and stuff, mm -hmm. right? Oh, yeah. What, what, what's going to happen when you get arrested to everybody, no matter what? Any? They're going to try to hold you for 24 hours. Okay. And they're going to interview you. Okay. Yes. And yes. you need to lawyer up when they yes. do. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. What, what, what's some of the things that they, that you do, like that, you know, they're going to do just from pop culture, maybe a mugshot. Have y'all ever heard of that? Yeah. Yeah. Sure, they do. Sure. They definitely do that. They yeah, do a lot of Fingerprints. identification. Fingerprints. And, and, okay. Yeah. Mugshot. Right. Yeah. So yeah. those are some yeah. things you, it, 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 those things don't surprise you, right? No. Yeah. It didn't surprise me. Yeah. But I'll tell you what did surprise me when they took my whole handprint. I'm like, oh, I never seen this on TV. They took my whole footprint, like my whole foot. Is it intimidation? Oh, no. This is what gave me hope because I'm like, whoever did this yeah. must have left a handprint. Gotcha. They must have left a footprint. Yeah. When mm -hmm. they took my saliva and my hair, I'm like, oh, well, whoever done this must have left saliva or a hair. So this is going to prove that I'm innocent. This is going to prove what I've been telling these officers gotcha. is true all along. You know, so I'm mm -hmm. like, no matter how ugly they get, no matter how mean they get, as long as I just remain and, and, and stay carrying myself with grace and dignity and treat them fairly, they're going to come around through their own this is what you were detective. Thinking. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking, you know. I, I'm giving them the benefit of the doubt yeah, that they're denying me. Yeah, what you would like me. to think is happening. Yeah. yeah. And most times, yes, but in this case, no. <laughs> no, it didn't work that way, you know. The... <laughs> oh. I want to interject that our engineer is Ziggy. He is super excited you're here, and he has some things on his mind, and you're welcome to throw this out anytime, Ziggy. Uh, yeah, topics for discussion or questions or anything. So, definitely. What, yeah, we want to hear from you, Ziggy. <laughs> so, through the through the whole trial, uh, from from a lot of the documentaries and stuff that I've read, it, it seems like you guys very much believed through it all that obviously you did not do this thing. You believed that the system was going to work the way it's supposed to. Um, when when did you start to get the inkling that this was pretty much this huge miscarriage of justice? Well, it didn't seem over until it was actually over. I held out hope all the way to the end until even... You mean even, the trial? Do you mean trial? Yeah, okay. during the trial. Even when the Judge Burnett was like, hey, do you have any reason why this sentence should not be carried out? And I'm like, finally, I got to talk Finally. in court, yeah. you know? Because I'm innocent. Yep. 
And he was like, well, the jury found different, and it didn't matter. Yeah, they don't care what you say. Yeah. And I remember my attorneys telling my attorneys, I, I want to testify. I want to tell the jurors where I was at. You know, the people I was with need to be able to testify as well and tell the jurors where I was at. But he never called any of them, never called any of my witnesses. And I remember, like I, I mentioned earlier, him telling me not to say anything to the media. And so the media didn't have my point of view to share with the people. But later on, he's like, hey, these people from New York City, from HBO, want to film. Paradise Lost? Yeah. yeah. Want to, well, they didn't have that name then. Okay. But that's what it would become, Paradise Lost, which was the greatest thing ever. But at this time, I don't, you know, I don't know the future, right? All I right, don't so have a crystal ball. This leads a lot of questions, but go ahead. And so he's like, we, we need to work with these people because they're going to give us some money to hire experts to do testing and, and investigate and all of these things that we can't do right now because it costs money. So I'm, I trust him. I'm like, what, whatever works. And, but he's like, you still can't talk to the regular media, but you got to talk to the HBO media. And I'm like, oh, it's like a huge conflict of interest in my heart, you know, to, mm -hmm. to be kind of disrespectful to one group of people, you know, and, and just kind of ignore them when they're earnestly asking me questions, you know. But I understand at the same time as a kid, he's the adult, he's the attorney. He must know. And you were just a kid. Yeah, you were 17 I was just a kid. when you were 16. in jail. 16 in jail. Oh, yeah, I 16. just turned 16. I, I turned 17 in five barracks, cell five at the diagnostic unit in Pine Bluff. <sighs> All right, it, there, there we go. I think I'm about 19 or 18. No, I'm about 19 in that. That's uh, right after I, um, Warden Tony gave me a Christmas present uh, when it turned 97 that year. He goes, I went to classification and gave me a Christmas present as my first clerk's job. And in, in Arkansas, and in, 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 well, in all states, you're a slave if you're mm -hmm. convicted of a felon. You, you become a slave and you are sentenced to hard labor until you die, you know, or, or until your sentence runs out. But yeah. for me, since it was life without, until you die, you know. You, you were sentenced life without parole. Right. Served 18 years. Right. Look, can I backtrack a little? And I know that you got a lot on your mind here too. Oh yeah, I will look, ramble, look, so look, please right, jump look. in. <laughs> so why did you have confidence in your defense attorney to talk to certain media? You were taking his advice still. Of course, I know you were young. But he's the one who didn't call any witnesses on your behalf. Well, I what, didn't know did that. You, I did, didn't know that. I, he's telling me that he's going to call these people. But he never did. Never did. Your defense, and did he ever explain that? To you, he did not. And, and at the end of it, he's like, "Well, I guess we'll win it on appeal. I'll have you home in a year." Uh, yeah. And, and what's so bad is I remember during Board Dyer, mm -hmm. the the process when they're selecting jurors, mm -hmm. he's like, he kind of whispers over towards me, and he's like, "Jason, I want you to look into the eyes of these jurors, mm -hmm. these potential jurors, okay. and just tell me what kind of feel you get. Mm -hmm. Do you feel hate?" Uh, curiosity would just what kind of feel do you get I'm like sir I cannot see that far and and this is just a table we're sharing a yeah. table that they're being invited into because it's like not in the courtroom proper it's like in a room in the courtroom building you know but it's okay. like a so little you're, conference room. you're sitting with your attorney he's doing void dire void dire yes and, and why because your vision or, or well any attorney wants their client, their client is supposed to assist in their own defense, right? Yes. So to assist, he wants me to look at the jurors and each one as they come through and just get a feel for them as a person, you know? Because when, when you look a person in the eye, you can get a connection. Well, sure. Some type of connection. But I can't see your eyes. I can't see you. And I tell Paulus, I'm like, I can't see him. And he's like, you need glasses. I'm like, yeah. He's like, well... When the trial's over with, I'll get you a pair of glasses. What? Yeah, he should have said, Your Honor, I want to put the trial on pause yes. right now. Get my client some glasses so he can assist in his own defense. Okay, this is a minor point, but maybe not. You're, you needed glasses. You wore glasses as a kid. Well, I never had glasses. But you needed them. I needed them. I, in, in my school... Um, you can get seated alphabetically, yeah. you know, so I'm already right oh, there so at the teacher. The front. You know, I'm at the front, yeah. you know, so it wasn't bad, 
you know, for me, yeah. in, you know, in class, but. Okay. But, but on the other hand, I mean, <laughs> Janie, Velvet, I mean, how scientific is a defense attorney saying, give me a feel? I don't know. Maybe that's good. Maybe it's not. I, I, I don't know. I think us guys do not have good radar. It's the <laughs> women who have radar on people. I, I, I feel. I, I don't know. What did you think about that question? Give me a feel after you look in their eyes. I, I, I would have been so happy just to have been able to help, you know, like I was doing something at mm -hmm. the time. Yeah. And, and, and hindsight now. It might not have helped, yeah. you know, but maybe it would have. Maybe I'd have seen mm -hmm. in the, uh, mm -hmm. the uh, foreman's eyes, Ken Arnold, and known that he was just there to, you know, what? convict us irrespective of whatever evidence. Or I mean, anything through. would help, at least if you could at least see, because you can see a lot in people's eyes, like their intention or what yeah. they're thinking. And if, I mean, if somebody's sitting there cross-armed, staring at you, glaring at you, you're like, clearly I don't want that person. You know what I mean? It's just, it helps. And... Wearing glasses, like right now I'm not wearing my glasses and I can't hardly see and it's it's very stressful. So I'm being in a stressful situation where you can't necessarily see your surroundings and knowing that, you know, your life is pretty much on the line. It's got to be very unnerving. Oh, yeah. And, and, yeah. and so there I was, I was a kid and then I'm in the courtroom and you have all these people in the stands and they're saying mean things, hateful things. And I remember um, years what, what, later. Behind you, you heard people talking? Oh, yeah, yeah. And then going in and out of the courtroom, like yeah. people just. Did you have to wear I, I a vest? I don't want to ever repeat with the yeah. things people said. Do you have to it, wear a vest? Oh, yeah, bulletproof oh, yeah. vest. I wore a bulletproof vest because people were giving us death threats. Look, that's Look. all that's thanks so to scary. Oswald. <laughs> 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 He's the reason all y'all have to wear those when yeah. you get convicted. When he was shot, that. when he was shot, yeah. yeah. So look, look, look. Here's the flip side to this, guys. If w when these potential jurors are in the room with you and you can't really look at them in the eye, are, are they viewing you as not sincere because you're not looking at them or focusing on them? But then that's not your fault. That's the flip side, right? That's the flip side. And, and that's Maybe the thing we don't know. His strategy might have worked against you if the potential juror thought you were aloof, non-caring. Your your look was a gaze and not not really a concerned look. I'm just guessing here. Well, but we couldn't make eye contact. So to them, maybe they're thinking I'm averting my gaze out of guilt. Yep. If you can't yeah. make eye contact with someone, people sometimes read that as, mm -hmm. oh, you won't look me in the eye. You won't look me in the eye. Yeah. I'm an anxious person, so I can't look people in the eye very often. I can't either. I have a very hard time looking people directly in the eye. I'm kind of like a dog in that sense. <laughs> like, look me in the eye. I think you're going to attack me. Well, I, I, think, oh, no. I think a lot of it would, like... <laughs> Not you, but yeah. I mean, like, everybody. Well, you know, and a lot of times growing up, you know, your parents are in trouble and they want you to look you in the eyes and you oh, know it's yeah. always going to be bad. So you're just like, I don't want to look anybody in the eye. Especially when you're in a stressful situation, you know, a lot of those people in there exactly aren't favorable of you. It's really hard to look them in the eyes, you know? Yep, especially if you're in trouble, you want to look away because that's just a natural yeah. thing to do. You just want to yeah. look away. Look, so. um, uh, all right. <laughs> so what you're describing happens, this sort of voir dire and, and, and experiences with defense attorneys and, and the system, you know, stacked against you to a lot of people today. That and is true. that's what you are about right now. Yes. That website right there. Claim justice. Um, I was just in a courtroom in El Paso a few weeks ago for one of our innocent clients, Daniel Viegas. Mm. And he got railroaded when he was 15 years old for a crime he didn't commit. And what makes it so bad is the detective that made him give a false confession tried to make one of the kids that was shot or, or shot at and, and who had his best friend shot give a false confession too until the kid's father showed up and run him away, run the detective yeah. away. And, and and we've since discovered he, he does that to people and that's what he does, you know. That, it, that uh, abuses his authority. That prosecutor? People, that or a, a specific detective. All right. Yeah. Look, so what what's the good news outcome of that that case? He was found not guilty. And he had been incarcerated for in Texas for over he went to prison at age 15. He was in prison for 15, 15 years. We got his false confession thrown out. Mm -hmm. So his case overturned. So he was free on what, on an appeal bond, but mm -hmm. 
but he couldn't go anywhere or do anything, even though he was living not in prison anymore for the past three years. Yeah. Um, our board member, John Mimbela, has a construction company in El Paso. So he got him a job. Um, Daniel fell in love with this girl named Faith. And, and I'll tell you what, what's really cool, um, it was before he got out, he, he was... People go through a lot of emotions when you're in prison. Oh, yeah. You know, and especially when it's for something you didn't do and, and they've given you forever for, for daring to say, hey, I'm innocent, you know. And so he, he had lost all faith. And, and he was at that point to where you, you talk to God and you're like, hey, I can't not do this anymore. Yeah. I can't do this anymore. You know, I can't. And the very next day he gets a letter and it's from a girl named Faith. <laughs> okay. And that's who he fell in love with. And, and to him, that's Letter like God, like, hey, like, if you've lost your faith, I'm going to give you some faith. <laughs> this is what it. you need. That's right? So, and, 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 and that's that's what turned his, that's what gave him the strength to still stand strong and make it through that sentence yeah. until we could get him out. Because it is hard, you know? It is hard. And, and so now... They have a little baby, a couple of little babies. Um, he, he works for uh, uh, John. He's got a construction in construction business. He's got a house. And so he'd been three, uh, free for a few years. And, uh, of course, on a pill bond, he can't, like, go anywhere you know, yeah. without special permission. Yeah. But he's still living a life he had never lived. You know, the state's threatening to retry him. And we're saying, well, let's do it because the evidence yeah. proves he's innocent. Yeah. You mm -hmm. know, and... So I remember his baby was due just this past July 4th, right? And he has to go in periodically for urine tests and all this stuff. And so they, he came in and they're like, hey, you have a baby due July 4th, right? And he's like, yeah. And they're like, it would be a shame for that baby to grow up without his father or without her father. Mm. You know what? We can make that, that worry all go away. All you got to do is take an Alfred plea. Which is what you had. Yeah. It's what I was forced to do. And so, this is what their prosecutions and states forcing innocent people to do all over America these days. So it's in Texas as well? In yes. Texas as what, well. Yeah. Can we have Velvet explain what that is? Yes. Yeah, the Alfred plea is when you plead guilty, but you are released on innocence. So basically, um, it's the way of the state to not compensate you for the time that you spent in jail. Because, yeah. I don't know if you know this, but gotcha. if you are proven totally innocent, meaning you are totally released and all of that, um, you get compensation from the state right. that you were imprisoned in. And uh, states like to wiggle out of that with the Alfred plea. They like to say, hey, case is still closed. You're still guilty, but you can go. We don't have to pay you a cent. And on paper, you're still guilty. Yes. Right. All right. But we, you're maintaining your innocence, so it's kind of a little dance in a little yeah. gray area. Look, weird question. Can you vote? I can vote. Good. I do vote. So, Alfred Plea, you can vote? Yes. Okay. Good. And voting is important. Yeah. It is very, very important. important. Very important, important man. All right, so I, I guess I thought... Go Beto! Oh. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Yes. <laughs> you Beto vote. Yes. <laughs> Clever. We'll all be voting this week. Right. Yes. 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 Um, all right. So, Jason, God dang, man. Can you sleep in prison? Or is it noisy? You know, my it is very noisy where I was at. I lived in a barracks, an open barracks, where you anywhere from 50 to 76 guys in the barracks, you know, and um, you just in sleep other words, no, side not, by side. Not a private room. Oh, no, not in a private room. Uh, and, and what was so bad, when I first got there, the, the people only had the media that they were being shown, and it was all satanic, all child murder, all like all the hate buttons that people had. The media uh, pressed against, them against the West Memphis. Yes, history. against okay. us. And, media um, pressed all these buttons that you know when you call something a ritual abuse, just 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 the the words itself are just inherently unfair. Mm -hmm. It implies that there is you know some sort of nefarious organization that does this on a regular basis that, you know it's just outrageous mm -hmm. i'm sorry go ahead oh please and 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 it doesn't have to be that specifically uh, yeah. because the state they're going to use whatever they can against you right oh, and, yeah. and 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 the way they do it is they're like what about you as a person 
can we find a juror to hate yep. enough yep. to convict you without any evidence? Talk to us. In other words, a juror can just look at you and say, oh, just look at them. They must have done it. They are wearing a demon seed shirt or something that uh, we don't like. And we don't we're, like it. We're the, you know, uh, we're the old timers and we run this neighborhood and this courtroom and uh, we don't like the way you look. Exactly. And, and so it becomes something other than the facts, about the facts of the case. You know, now they're bringing up Metallica lyrics, Stephen King books. Oh, yeah. And, when and I saw that in your court case, the Stephen King stuff, I was like, really? Y'all are just stretching, it, it, stretching yes, right there. It, all right. So let, let's point it out. Velvet, correct me if I'm wrong. All right. Okay. And, you, and, and two Jason, look, they, they found you were reading a Stephen King book. They find some passages in the book that are dark yeah. and and somehow pull this out and say look what he's reading some shakespeare too hey yeah. do we do we, well, right any any great Anything, author is yeah. going to have violence and conflict in the story otherwise it ain't a story right mm -hmm. all right i'm sorry and so is it is it but, did i summarize that right yeah you yeah, did yeah you did you did yeah it, it was just when they brought that out, it was just like, it was a stretch. It was a total stretch because at that point, there was Stephen King movies out. There was Stephen King. Like, I mean, nobody out the there knows who Stephen left. King is. Like, right. <laughs> is Arkansas different to where Stephen King's a bad <laughs> author? It was bad to those people that they selected in that juror that I could mm -hmm. not see. I couldn't see those people. So I don't know if they, what they like or just like, what, what? What makes their, you know, boat float? Uh, Janie Slash. Uh, yes. What's up? I, I guess here's what I've always wondered. And we've talked about. Has a juror ever come back to you, you know, Jason, and said, "How are you? I'm sorry," or anything? No, actually, they haven't. Um, I haven't really. Okay. Even thought about them really honestly since I've since I've experienced Just that. Um, All right. Look, but I, I I know their job could not have been easy because yeah. they're just getting information from the prosecution. My my attorneys didn't give them any information. They didn't hear about my uncle where I was mowing his grass. They didn't hear any of these things, you know? Yeah. And so all they hear is the prosecution saying, look at them. There's no, you know, when he was talking about, when Fogelman was talking about Damien, it's like, look yeah. at him. There's no soul in there, you know? <laughs> <It was. laughs> Damien was just an awkward kid. Yes. He was just very awkward. Like I was, I when I look back on y'all's uh, media coverage during it, it was, he was just very, inward very inward person when it came to strangers and i don't think that helped him in his case because the courtroom is a theater and i have family members who are police officers and so if you ever get in trouble remember the courtroom is a theater you be as personable and as polite as you can be because they can use anything against you oh, yeah, yeah. So. I rem speaking of that i remember um <clears throat> like say we were in jail for like over 289 days so yeah. the trial didn't start immediately right yeah. so it, it didn't take place until uh the end of january and february mm -hmm. and so of 94 of 94 okay. we were arrested Mur june the 3rd of 93 kids died in may 93 you mm -hmm. were arrested next month correct and uh and then trial uh, uh, almost a year later almost a year later so your hair grows in a year mm -hmm. um they weren't giving damien a haircut in the jail mm -hmm. and so we're, we're at the courthouse ready for trial. And Val Price, who was Damien's attorney at the time, says, Your Honor, my client needs a haircut. Can we get Damien a haircut? And Burnett says, If you want to cut his hair, I have no objection to that. But we're not sending him to a barber and we're not bringing him a barber. So, okay. the attorney exercised his barber skills on Damien's <laughs> oh hair. Oh, no. And so Damien's like, oh, what does it look like? Who's got a mirror? Well, so his asking, lawyer's he's not a, a He's woman. asking you, what do I look like? I can't see. <laughs> <laughs> but no. <laughs> so You should have said great. <laughs> right? You look great. Okay. 
You look great. But the bailiff was like, here, here's a mirror. You can look at yourself. But it was the mirror he uses to like look under the seats oh, for like yeah. bombs and stuff. Right, right. And so Damien's like looking in the mirror. He goes, ah, I guess this a do. You know, he's combing his hair. Well, somebody filmed that like threw a crack in the door and put it on the news and said, look, this dude is so unconcerned about this trial. Look at him. He's just looking at messing with his hair. In other so, words, concerned about his image or, yeah. or concerned about looking pretty oh, or whatever. He's just concerned about his hair, and he's yeah. on a trial for his life. So, like you said, anything yeah. they can yep. use against you, they Medial will. Medial twisted. I remember one time he yawned, right? Yeah. Just yawned. And they wrote in the paper that he guffawed, like he was laughing, but he was just yawning. But in a still shot, you can't tell, but they could write anything they want about it. Guffawed. That's yeah. horrible. Yeah. Like, like laughing. Yeah. Uproariously. Ah. Uh. It, like he's laughing at what's happening. In wh look, what do you think about the, the three-part documentary, the other documentary, West of Memphis, uh, and the movie itself? I mean, uh, any thoughts, uh, or or have you do you care to watch them? Oh, oh, I've I've watched them all. Um, you were you were at the screening for Devil's Knot, weren't you? Oh yeah, I, I yeah. was there during the filming. You you were the cool. only one, right? Damien wasn't there, and Jesse uh, wasn't Damian there. Damien boycotted it. Oh, from the start, I didn't know um, that. he really made my life hell during oh. that. Um, but hey, I get it. You know, whatever. He just wanted to put it behind him, right? Um, no, not really. <laughs> but uh, okay. <laughs> when when they came with that film, they're like, "Hey, we want this thing to be as accurate as possible." Yeah, because right? it's based on so a, here's it's based the, on the book by the journalist who covered yeah, y'all's yeah. case, right? Like Mara yeah. Leverett, who who covered our case in Arkansas, the only only journalist, journalist mm -hmm. who covered it factually and accurately yes. okay. without uh, 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 buying into the satanic panic madness, right? Mm -hmm. She's like, no, 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 let's look at the facts, people. Let's not get, you know, taken with the smoke screen that the yeah. prosecution's putting up. Let's look at the facts. So she is awesome. Mara is awesome. She loves, she, first of all, she's a supreme journalist. She, she does her job well. She's very professional. But during that, she came to believe in us and believe in our case. And, and as a people do, you develop a, a real love for people. Sure. Yeah. You know? mm -hmm. yeah. She loves us. She loves Damien. She loves Jesse. She loves me. And she, she doesn't just love us. She loves Pam Hicks as well. Yeah. Because And, and the other family members. Because we're all victims here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know? We didn't lose our lives like the boys did, but we yeah. still lost our lives. Yeah, you know, mm -hmm. and you can't you can't ever get that time back. No, no, you can't. You and, can't get your twenties no. back. Not yeah. to mention, there is a killer out there. Has yeah. anyone else been arrested or, or charged? No, or? no, they have not. Okay, I, I'm sorry, but you were, say it again, Ziggy. Uh, they uh, there never will be. No, uh, because of the Alfred plea mm -hmm. that. Uh, you guys kind of were railroaded to take uh, the the state of Arkansas considers the Robin Hood Hills murders solved, mm -hmm. and even though it's pretty much consensus, obviously that you're innocent, because that mm -hmm. Alfred plea is on the books, they do not want to investigate because uh, investigating uh, would make them uh, pretty much lose their clean record. Because the state of Arkansas still claims that they have never wrongfully convicted someone in the state of Arkansas. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, he summarized But I will say <laughs> that Scott Ellington said that should we find evidence pointing to guilt to who did this, he would accept it. And I will say that my attorney, Mr. John Phillipsborn, and my attorney, Mr. Blake Hendricks, mm -hmm. and our private investigator, Mr. Quinn, are working. Okay. They are working right now, all right, very hard on this case. They have not given up. I have not given up. Yep. Yeah. The state can give up all they want, but they're yep. going to have yep. to do their job when we bring this to them. Yeah. They're going to have to, and the people should demand it. When we last watched Devil's Knot, um, it, you know, they portrayed the judge as it being extremely conservative and against you all along, and 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 then they showed the preacher, you know, preaching to the small community about Satan is out there or what have you. Are those fairly accurate? Oh, yeah. Um, I, I think uh, I didn't see these things per personally, but like during on the marquees of the churches and stuff in West Memphis, yeah. it was all about uh, protect your 
people from Satanism and all this stuff. It was stuff like that? Yeah. Yeah. So. Well, and uh, if you go back and you read the transcripts and you look at everything that the judge said, the judge did not have the best interests of the defendants in mind throughout the entirety oh, of no, the trial. No. no, like it's uh, like there's a point in the trial uh, in in yours and uh, Damien's uh, initial trial where it's very obviously like that should have been declared a mistrial just because the confession that was ruled it invisible was brought up. Yeah. Like the inadmissible evidence was brought up in the court and right. the judge uh, just waves away he said, the request uh, for a mistrial. He said, uh, he said um, I don't believe there's a juror up there. I don't believe there's a soul up on that jury that doesn't know about Mr. Miss Kelly's confession. That's what he said. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about Jesse for a minute. Okay. The way they coerced him into telling the story that he told, which he told many different versions until they started correcting him. Um, if they ever, if you guys ever reopen the case, do you think they're going to try to use that again? Or do you think they are just going to dismiss it now that you everybody know, pretty much knows that it was coercion? They might, but if they really want to see justice in this case, they won't. Okay, good. Because um, okay. I would someone, hate for Jesse to get... It takes someone yeah. strong and courageous in those yeah. positions to to go after the facts yeah. of a case instead of just doing the same old business these systems have been doing for generations. Yeah. And that's just find some poor kid, let them know the truth is not going to set him free, make sure they understand that because we're the gatekeepers and we're not going to accept their truth. Make sure they understand that over and over again. Make sure they understand yeah. that we're going to kill them. But also make sure they understand the only way they can save their life is to work with us. And we'll yeah. give them a good deal. Well, didn't they offer Jesse's family like $300,000 if he talked to the police? The, uh, there was a, a reward yeah. for solving the crime. I don't know if it was 300 grand or I, 30 grand. I believe or, it was uh, 35. 35 grand? Five oh, grand. I'm sorry. My mistake. Yeah. Um, I knew it was a 3,000 something dollar uh, limit, but um, I think that's just dirty to offer it to somebody and then have them make a confession. And, and, and I think it was May the 11th. Like the crime occurred on May the 5th. It was May the 11th. Jesse and some other kids from his trailer park, mm -hmm. Highland Trailer Park, that he hangs with saw a suspicious man yeah on some railroad tracks yeah. and they're like oh my god that might be the killer yeah okay and so they call the police and say hey mm -hmm. if if he turns out to be the one do we get the reward money yeah mm -hmm. now clearly jesse was after the reward money yeah clearly jesse was looking for who committed this crime yeah mm -hmm. clearly it wasn't jesse yeah Clearly, he had no idea about this, any of this crime. This wasn't the possible person that turned up later in the fast food restaurant. No, I believe it was totally separate. Different because guy. the fast food restaurant okay. guy was off of the highway next to the forest. Another mystery to this whole thing, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. And, and the police never went into the fast food restaurant. They never went in until the next morning. And they took all the evidence, like the blood and all that and the mud. They took and, all and of that. And some sunglasses. Yeah, and some sunglasses. And look how and easy they never analyzed it or tried to match it to the crime scene. Never did. The detective should have kept those glasses. Yep. Got those fingerprints off of it. Mm -hmm. Should have sent that blood in to be tested to see if it matched any of those boys' blood. Yeah. We yeah. don't know if it did or not, but it could have. Yeah. Yeah. You know? Proclaimjustice.org has a Facebook and a website, right? Mm -hmm. right? And um, there's, there's a Facebook page. All right, so can you kind of roughly talk to us about, I know there's many, but how many are you guys working on at the moment? Or, or maybe kind of how many have you helped? I think it said 87 on the website or something that um, cases you've overturned. Oh, I don't know about it. Uh, we haven't overturned 87 cases. Oh, um, okay. Uh, we're, we're still new. Like, that's um, just people exonerated in 2013, not by us, but just various over groups. And okay, gotcha. or various okay. organizations. Okay. And um, okay. we're about to uh, redo all of our stuff. But uh, here, here's how Proclaim Justice came to life. Um, in Arkansas, 
for many years, the only people that believed in our innocence were people that came from California, New York. And so the state said, listen, we know we got the right people. Anybody who says differently, they're just outsiders. Don't yeah. listen. Oh, excuse me. Oh, Don't listen yeah. to them. Labeling right? them. They're out. Labeled mm -hmm. them. Right. They're tainted. They're tainted. They don't know. They don't know the case like we know the case. So, oh. John Harden, Lori Davis, Holly Ballard, Brian Frazier, you know, uh, Rob Fisher. Yeah. All these guys and gals in Arkansas said, no, we're here in Arkansas, and we know they're innocent. Yeah. <laughs> so that lie you are telling, don't believe that. So they started Arkansas Take Action. Great. Oh, right? Okay. To yeah. combat that lie. And so when, when, when we were finally released, of course, Arkansas Take Action was no longer needed. And John was like, dude, next to getting married, next to having my son, seeing you guys freed was the best feeling in the world i want to do that for other innocent people and i was like dude i promised innocent people i met growing up in prison i would not forget them all right yeah. let's do something mm -hmm. and so we created proclaimjustice.org a nonprofit, nonprofit organization and that is our job yeah. to go find innocent people and do the hard work to free them and it doesn't have to be a dna case we uh, john is a licensed investigator we've got a couple of investigators uh, you hire investigators us. to look at solved cases because yeah. the person's in prison. Right. And, and we go out and do the hard work. We go knock on the doors. We go interview people. We go find things. See, and I think that this is an important distinction to make uh, between Proclaim Justice and a lot of other uh, organizations that do this type of work is you guys don't just take DNA cases because usually DNA cases tend to be the easiest to overturn because it's it's very cut and dry there's tends to be a lot less legwork and labor and that's uh, an important distinction is you guys are doing taking the absolute hardest cases and and that is amazing to me that is yeah truly admirable thank you, thank you. It, it, the, our system of justice is just not based on truth fair statement that's a fair statement. Yeah. It's based on who can scream the loudest? Who can who show... Who has the most money? Who has the most money? There you go. That's what mm -hmm. it filters down to. Right. And who has power and who doesn't? Who's who powerless? Been. Who's always been powerless? Who's powerless? Marginalized groups, minorities, and the poor. poor. And yeah. the poor. This is justice in America. And, you know, isn't it and justice for all? No. It's and justice for the wealthy. In my view, the, you're you're an example, man. Yeah. Look, when you got out, what did you have? Did you have any assets? Assets? Money, oh, a car, I've, I've been, a job. I mean, I've I, been working forever since I was 16, and and I'd yeah. never earned a single penny no. out of all the hard labor I'd done. And so when I got out, I had I didn't even have a shirt to put on. Yeah. And so. Holly. Because you had uh, outgrown it. <laughs> you had uh, outgrown the one you went entered with. <laughs> right, yeah. yeah. And then they yeah. didn't even give me my clothes back. No. Oh, wow. I'd be like, I'd be like I don't like Metallica anymore. So I, I need a new shirt. <laughs> no. <laughs> Actually, uh, Lars gave me that very, not the exact shirt, but he's like, weren't you wearing Metallica Damage Incorporated shirt when you got locked up? I'm like, yeah. He goes, we're going to give you that shirt back. Oh, that's amazing. That's nice. Awesome. And then, and then. Oh, we got to see that picture of you and Lars. So, I, and I'm sorry if you showed it already, Ziggy. I've been kind of leaning away, but. <laughs> Look at that. Hey. Aww. Look at you handsome dude. That is an awesome guy right there, Lars. Or yeah. He really cares about people. And um, he really, you know, stuck his nose out there for us. And the, and the whole band, you know. And, 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 and people, I mean, we, we all have jobs and things that take our time and energy. But yeah. for someone to say, you know what, I care so much about another person mm -hmm. that I'm going to make time. I'm going to yeah. make the effort to help mm -hmm. or just to say, yep. hey, yep. it is above and beyond you know yeah the after you got out so did you ever have a knock at the door and then there's you know james hetfield or 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 you know i don't know something I, weird like that did happen okay all right uh, not exactly look, look who it is man there's and, eddie and that's me and holly yeah. and eddie oh. better and uh and so 
I mean, I'm, uh, the Devil's Not film, right? Yeah. Holly and I worked on it very hard with Pam Hicks. Yeah. And we got to know her, and she adopted me as her son, not legally, but she's like, I adopted you. And we hugged it out and cried and oh. all the good stuff. <laughs> <laughs> and so, um, so I'm in Toronto, like Canada, over, mm -hmm. you know, over the border, and it's we're, it's in we're in it's like some type of after party thing there's a whole bunch of people i'm like feeling so out of place i'm yeah. just you know there's like all these movie producers and movie stars and holly's like right next to me you know she's good as gold she's like oh it's cool just chill out these people are you know they're just people yeah. just people like you you know they're having a good time yeah. and i noticed like maybe with 15 people in between us lars ulrich and i go and, and now it's a noisy environment, right? right. Mm -hmm. And I just whisper, I said, there goes Lars to Holly. Right. And he jumps in the air and he turns around you? and goes, and there's Jason. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, what? From that point And then he just came over there and, and now he you're hung out with and, us. And from that point forward, you're buddies. Well, you know, he, he'd been buddies since the doing the documentaries the for Because yeah. uh, okay. gotcha. they lent the music for yeah, Paradise yeah, Lost. Yeah, it was yeah. their very first time that they did loan their music out for a uh, professional score. Yeah. yeah, that's awesome. So that was a big deal. And that's that's what hits a lot of people, here, like hearing Orion yeah. when I'm convicted and yeah. all that. Yeah. Which is a very weird The The, the instrumental. It's <laughs> yeah. the instrumental. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Off yeah. Master of Puppets. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah. They did very few instrumentals, didn't they? Hmm? They did very few instrumentals. But I they think. did them, uh, or do them very well. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That, that's oh. what, how I did my painting. I made a recording tape with just their instrumentals, but I included To Live Us Die in there, even though he just says a little poem, but it's mostly music. <laughs> okay, well, let's talk about your art. Um, tell us a little about kind of your hobbies. I, I kind of lost my art when I got locked up. I was so punished by the state. I'm still kind of traumatized, um, but I'm looking to pick it up. I've got some supplies and stuff and i'm for so long i've just been so busy and i've just been like doing this doing that doing this but i'm now able to carve out a little bit of time for art again and i've, I've got a few sketches on canvas ready to paint of various people that i want to give a piece to for thanks you know mm -hmm. i have a tambourine that i caught in portland at a pearl jam show so i've got heads face on it i just have to paint it now so what i'm doing i'm, I'm doing all my sketches right yeah. now and then i'll bust out my paints and do the painting but i'm still also writing my memoirs and during our proclaiming justice board meeting this weekend yeah. mm -hmm. um the members of the board uh natalie haynes and John Harden and everybody, they're like, when are you going to get your book finished? I'm like, I write on it all the time, but you know, I also have all these other responsibilities yeah. and work. And they're like, okay, we're going to take some of your work off so you can get your book finished. Yeah. They're pushing you we to get know, your memoirs. Yeah, because no we know we work you to death, Jason. No so, kidding. Yeah. Which I work all the time. But I'm passionate about the work because I care about the people, yes. you know? And so, but I've got a ton of material already. Um, I just write down everything I remember, the things I've gone through, people I've met, things, stories and stuff. Um, it, and co it covers my life before I was in prison, mm -hmm. you know, during prison, obviously, and now even after prison and, and building PJ. So um, uh, it would include the tree and the shed in the field. Oh, yeah. oh yes. And, and, and forward. Oh, yeah. Well, even or further even back. Even back. Okay. Yeah. Uh, All right, yeah. cool. Uh, I have very few happy stories. Oh boy. <laughs> it's all conflict all the time. And Holly cannot read any of my stuff because it just breaks her heart uh -huh. all the time, you know. Your brother's doing She's okay? She's so close. You know, that's when a person goes to prison, your whole family goes to prison, yeah. right? I was 16. My little brother Matthew was 14. My little brother Terry was nine at this time. And my mom, I remember. Her boss is like, I know you're going to want to be at the hearings. I know you're going to want to be at the trial. You're just not going to have a job to come back to. She's like, I'm going to be there for my son. Yeah. Even though I couldn't see her and even though since she was a witness, she couldn't be in the courtroom. She was there. She lost her job. Yeah. 
I got arrested the last day of school. I'm in jail during that summer. Well, school started back yeah. before the trial. Right. So yeah. my little brother's got to go to school. Yeah. yeah. Well, guess what? The people, like they go to school in Marion, Marion, you know? Yeah. The trailer park is just a small amount of people. The rest of them are from dollhouses, and they just were so nasty and horrible to my brothers. They all, both of them got suspended, expelled. My mom tried to take them to different schools. Same thing would happen. Yeah. She tried to homeschool them. Of course, now they're growing up. They have just normal kids have angst and stuff oh, yeah. like that. Yeah. And then you couple it with this humongous injustice mm -hmm. and this horrible way that the people are treating them. Stigma, yeah. It did yeah. not go well. Yeah. Are they doing well now, your brothers? Little, little Terry hasn't had an education since he was nine. Okay. He works at a Taco Bell. He does his best that he can. He does the best that he can. So they, they, they I'm sorry to interrupt. They, they were victimized because their older brother was in prison. Yeah. Or in jail. Mm -hmm. And I remember when I, I remember growing up with Matthew, that dude can skateboard, right? Yeah. Better than anybody I know in real life. And, but he worked hard for it. I mean, he would do ollies and bust up his shins. I mean, he worked hard for it, you know, yeah. until he got the trick. And so when I'm in prison, he's still skateboarding. And they moved to Memphis, Tennessee. And Matthew was 17 at this time. And Creature Skateboarding Company was doing a tour, right? Yeah. To all the major cities. And what they would do is they um, would stop and skate with the local skaters. So yeah. they're in Memphis, and the local one of the local skaters is Matt. And they're like, dude, you got some mad skills. You know, you're awesome. How old are you? And he's like, 17, but I turned 18, April 21st. He's like, whoa, well, we're going down to Miami, but we'll come back up here and go to Chicago. We'll come through here after your birthday, and, and if you want to go with us and be a professional skateboarder, Woo. we got you. And? Mm -hmm. When they made it to Memphis, they were looking for Matt. Yeah. Someone said he got run over by a drunk driver. They went to the hospital and found him. Shattered his leg. He had over like a dozen operations in four uh, years. Had like a metal rod a down his event. leg. Uh. With electro giz yeah. gizmos. <sighs> After all those operations, he got addicted to Oxycontin, yeah. Yeah. pain medicine. And when the prescription ran out, his body still needed it. Yes. Yeah. yeah. He missed his chance. Skateboard. He has a cane now. Yeah. Um, you know? I love to him, man. And he ended up getting him, like, getting locked up in prison for real, you know? And yeah. For, you know, stealing stuff to support his habit. And he told me, um, he's like, Jason, I could not, I couldn't stop. Mm -hmm. and he's like, I would be crying. Yeah. Wanting to stop. But my body wouldn't let me. Yeah, that's it how potent. It. That's how potent this is. It's out there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's affecting our country like ain't nothing else. Yeah. So he was forced to go sober in prison instead of like some other place, you know, in, in a hospital or something, you know. And he, he's good now. Um, he's out. I haven't seen. So him yet, cold but. turkey in prison, but now he's off. Off oxycontin. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, twenty-five percent of innocent. Uh, uh, explain to me what what is it saying? Twenty percent of innocent cases involve false confessions. Yeah. Um, when you know you're innocent, you know where you're at, what you were doing, if you remember, and you try to tell that to the police. Yeah. But what they do is they tell you, no, that's not going to save you. You know. Or, or do they claim also we have someone else who says you're guilty? So. They and that's that all bullshit, well. mm -hmm. right? Oh, yes. Yeah, they'll pull out photos. They'll do all sorts of things to intimidate you and make oh, you yeah. confess to something that you probably would never confess to. We, you know, it's, it's odd to think that that would happen, but it happens a lot in our system. False confessions. Mm -hmm. Can we shift gears for a minute? Yeah. So we went and saw Halloween on Friday. Oh, wow. And Michael Myers freaking attacked Janie Slash numerous times oh, no. <laughs> with a sharp object. Look, uh. I have proof. And look, it, and there's a baby. They don't even care in the background. And uh, They're just going out the door. We're getting out of here. <laughs> and 
<laughs> so, and then he continued to terrorize uh, Jane. Oh my goodness. Oh man, that's not good. <laughs> Run, Jane. <laughs> Obviously, she's fine. She's right here. Okay. Am I? Am I? <laughs> you don't know. It's true. Don't know. It's true. You have been resurrected. Those are all taken from. If you from, watched uh, the haunting of Hill House, that could be true. That you're dead and sitting here. Just saying. Oh. I need to watch that. I keep hearing good you things about that. You need to watch it. It is the best horror film slash series I have watched since I was born. Woo! Wow. And I stake my claim on I've that. been alive like five years longer than her, so. <laughs> well, I guess that's okay. true. But I have watched the classics too. So. Um, sometimes we are able to capture that camera up there. And say hi. Yeah, so hey everybody. Yay. Bye -bye. Proclaim justice. Claim justice. Proclaim it. Yes. Uh, so I, I, have a, I have a question, Jason. Um, so obviously, it's, it's very difficult to overturn convictions because the system tends to believe that it is right that whatever they whatever verdict is is reached that is the correct verdict regardless of guilt or innocence what do you think is the the way to stop these faulty convictions from happening because I, I i figure it would be easier in the long term to stop fault uh, faulty convictions from happening than it is to go back and Oh, your Fix logic them. is sound. Your logic is sound, Ziggy. Um, it, it starts with the prosecuting attorney. The prosecuting attorney has all the power on choosing who to be prosecuted and what they're prosecuted for. And the people have a hand in this, too, because the people are like, oh, we only want to uh, elect someone that is hard on crime. crime. But yeah. you know what? No. There's no such Have you ever walked up and somebody says, "Hi, I'm crime." <laughs> crime does is a non-entity. You only have people. Yeah. You're only being hard on people, yeah. right? And prosecutors get their 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 respect per se by winning convictions, yes. right? Mm -hmm. So there has to be a change. It has to go from winning to convictions mm -hmm. to solving cases mm -hmm. so, yes. and we have to say you know what a strong prosecutor a tough prosecutor is going to get in there and do the hard work and when he finds out that this person is innocent he's going to be strong and say hey people this person's innocent and we're not going to be hard on this person we're going to be smart and we're going to find who really did it you know uh, so we as a people have to give prosecutors that power back we have to stop telling them they have to be hard on crime because you can't be hard on crime. You're only hard on people. And, and not being judged just on a, a record of convictions or a percentage of convictions. Correct. Um, right. And so this, yes, this, this whole thing, it, it, it's built on a system of battle. It's either this or that. That's our American system, right, Velvet? It's, it, like, a, it's like a sports match. If you look at how the defense and the prosecution battles each other. It's like a football game. Whoever wins gets the most money and the most notoriety. Do, don't other countries have a different view and it's not so much a us versus them in their you know, systems? I, I don't know. I'm Catalina just... has a question. Is it because communities don't have the money to have the prosecutors take the time or do you, is, is this, that's her question? Don't have money to have prosecutors. It, it might be. It might be. It might be the yeah. limited budget. I mean, can they go out there and hire that extra investigator I mean, that might be needed? It almost seems like they don't even care if you're innocent or guilty. They just want to prove you're guilty somehow. You know, it, that's what it feels like. Yeah, it looks like in some instances. But you can also look at, and I'm not going to get popular for this, but uh, the O.J. Simpson case. You can look at that, and it was more of uh, because the media was for him. It was the other way around. So I think the media has a lot to do with these bigger cases because it can really give the prosecution the fuel or the defense the fuel that they need. No, that's a good point. That's yeah, true. That's a valid point. Yeah. It is. Yeah. I, I can add to all of that that you were just discussing. Um, there's this thing called the Innocent Network Convention that happens every year in a different state. And what it is is people who are innocent that have done time 
for things they didn't do and they're now free and the people who championed their cause mm -hmm. we all gather every year in a different city mm -hmm. and we have panels to where mm -hmm. we discuss different uh, uh things related to criminal justice and um not this past year but the year before that was in san diego and i was on a panel mm -hmm. uh, about the media's role in cases and i yeah. shared this panel with uh, an attorney which was one attorney that worked on Damien's case later on in a pillet procedure uh, Steve Braga I was on the panel with uh, a guy from New York who went to prison for over 15 years twice for something he didn't do uh, Derek Hamilton uh, I was on the panel with this guy this kid whose parents were brutally murdered and the detective got a pretended he was on the phone with the kid's dad and says, your dad just said you killed them. And the kid was like, after hours and hours, well, if my dad says I did it, well, maybe I did. I don't know why I can't remember. Because yeah. he didn't remember because he didn't do it and his dad didn't say he did it. The detective was lying to him. So I'm on the panel with all these guys and Lonnie Sori, which is a guy from New York who is a media a person who, who deals with media and works with media. And so. My, the one, the analogy I use is not a football game like you so wonderfully yeah, did. Yeah, I'm sorry. Oh no, that's <laughs> beautiful. That's beautiful. I use I use I use a, a chess. Yeah, it is. It is a lot like chess as well. And there's only one queen on the board, and she's the media, mm -hmm. and she works with whoever gives her information. Her last move mm -hmm. is yeah, final. Yeah. Yeah. It influences yeah jurors, us, and and yeah. Look, I I guess the takeaway is when you see something on the news especially about this person is guilty stop and ask is there another perspective is there another angle is there more information yeah. and we all need to be the fact seekers on everything that we see here you know uh, in, in in news reports there's always more to the story yeah. and it's never clearly this way or that way but our system is set up to where it's they try and make it that way yeah. either you know they painted you as completely evil mm -hmm. way over here right oh yeah and 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 your defense attorney didn't reel any of that back it seemed like no uh, to even get you close to the middle ground and yet the jurors then are are sort of way over in that other extreme right you know they picked them that way oh yes um yeah and then they're only getting not not one side of the story but a false side of the story yeah. you know and and and, yeah. and in the vacuum of no information some information's got to go in that spot and the information they were given was false uh, but that's the only thing they had to go on as humans we're wired in a certain way to sometimes just jump on you call it uh, velvet the mob mentality or what did you go yeah it is mob mentality it's the same thing that happened in the salem witch trials that despite the evidence, they still believed that these people were guilty. Um, it's just like, it's like a mass hysteria in a sense, except for instead of everybody going crazy, everybody has a target. So that's what mom mentality is. It's and, like a and, form and of hysteria. But we're all kind of wired that way and we all need to check ourselves yeah. before we contribute to something, especially online. Uh, mm -hmm. With regards to a rumor of, of, of this or of that, you know, check yourself first, think first. You know, before making a final conclusion about the, the the veracity of something. Yeah. Hey, we have an event coming up on Friday. Oh. It is a Halloween art event. Oh, that's right. Yeah, yeah, Nightmare on Morton Street. Heck yeah. yeah. It's the 26th, which is this Friday. If you're still in Dallas, I want you to go to this. Actually, it's in Fort Worth. Okay. Um, <laughs> I can go to Fort Worth. I'll, I'll see what's up. Okay. I, I don't know what I got. I haven't looked at my calendar since. The other day, but it's gonna be a fun event. Cool, and we have a uh, we love, have a little um cool video that Little Spark Films made for, for this Nightmare event. on Morton Street. Yeah, Nightmare on Morton Street. Hey guys, Juan here with Project Zero Art and Brewing Arts as well. Wanting to invite you guys out to the Nightmare on Morton Street Halloween Art Event. It's going on October 26th, which is a Friday, starting at eight, running until two. We're gonna have a $500 cash prize costume contest as well as live party art. Uh, over 40 DFW local artists showcasing their best horror art and drink specials all night. The band Manifested will be playing a special performance as well as filming by Little Spark Films with Corpse Paint Show. 
Come on and join us at Nightmare on Morton Street, Friday, October 26th at Bar 2909. Cool. Yeah, Friday. That's awesome. What do you like to read or do or listen to now? Uh, we talked about your art, but... Oh, wow. I have such an eclectic taste, and I'm really geeky and nerdy, but... No, uh, please. Are we all? Yeah. Are we all yes. slightly nerdy on the inside? <laughs> right. <laughs> I'm just curious. Oh, man. Uh, I, I spent a lot of time catching up on things I missed out yes. on that I just heard about. Like emo. What's that? <laughs> Right. <laughs> <laughs> I'll teach you later. I'll I'll, I'll play you some videos. That's okay. from my, that's from my high school era. So. <laughs> but, um, Velvet loves emo. I do. I really do. <laughs> it's that's a guilty right. pleasure. That's all right. All right. Cool. Yeah. I will look forward to that. <laughs> I don't know what to expect. <laughs> um, but um, I've, I've been catching up honestly just on silly stuff like um. Whenever I get home from work late in the evening, and my wife gets home from work, mm -hmm. and when we, if we don't, if we're too tired to cook, or if we just have leftovers, we'll watch Friends. Mm -hmm. yeah. Friends. She's seen them. Didn't I that, haven't. That started oh, about I the year you that. went. Where? Yeah. Wow, that's I've heard about them for years <laughs> and years and years. You know, and I, I had, you know. But, well, we uh, were we were just talking about Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Yeah. 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 Oh. Yeah. I haven't seen those either. Yeah. yeah. That was a part of our childhood. Yeah, that was part of our childhood. Crazy. I've heard about those, and, and uh, I'm, I'll catch up on them. They're on my list. Yeah, watch Friends first. That's a good basis. There. Yeah, um, <laughs> we, we just got to the point where um, they had traded out the, the they lost a bet, and they switched their apartments. Oh, you know. Gotcha. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, I remember yeah, that yeah, episode. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so I don't know. It's fun. I love it. It's funny. Um, mm -hmm. and, and stuff. Um, I, I like all types of movies. Um, I like horror movies. Good. Um, okay. my wife. Holly likes horror movies, but she can't do. I think I heard which, I heard one of y'all say that y'all can't do anything supernatural. Oh, oh I said that's it her. freaks me out. Yeah, I still watch them, but I'm, I'll have nightmares. I'm all about the supernatural and the paranormal. I get scared of things, <laughs> but I like to freak myself out, so I do watch them. I like to go. We like to go to haunted places. We're just talking about going to um, haunted places and Where, ghost yeah, hunting. We want to go to Jefferson, Texas, the most haunted town in Texas. We should go to the oh, paranormal. Wow. Do like a group. Weekend. The paranormal weekend's coming up group vacation there are all these like ghost hunts uh at various places mm -hmm. right yeah, they do they do a night of ghost hunting you go to like six haunted locations and spend like an hour there or something like that or 45 minutes yeah. nothing happens sometimes there's sleepovers too which one is guy one guy did remember we were at that one house and he left he ran out there screaming because he said the toilet paper was thrown at him and there was nobody else in the bathroom like he's using oh, the restroom the and, like, I would somebody the threw toilet thing. paper at him and the door was closed and he was like i'm out i'm done and they had a really creepy room full of dolls in that house and the lights didn't work in that room that's where i go nope <laughs> his dolls it's the toilet paper no, the dolls. No. Oh, the dolls. No, she's That's fine. Right. Okay. Be like, well, thanks for the toilet paper. We have some right here, Velvet. Well, those are no, fine. No, I'm no, talking no, about no, the no, creepy no. 18th century porcelain dolls where their eyes are I fixed at a certain that. point to where they follow you wherever you go. <laughs> oh, yeah, you yeah, know what yeah. I'm talking about? Oh, yeah. Those scare me. They're my favorite. Oh, yeah. And my aunt for Christmas every year, sorry, but for every year up until I was about 14 or 15, gave me one per Christmas. And I stuffed them on the top of oh, my no. closet door. I used to do that when I was younger and I was scared of them. One time I opened it, French doors to a closet door. One time I opened it and I had an inkling to look up and one of the dolls had a lamp in its hand and it was leaning over. It might have been coincidence, but uh, I got rid of them after that. <laughs> I threw them out. Yeah. <laughs> Leaning like, in. Bye-bye. <laughs> I've, I've recently just started to like things that have horrified me, like clowns. I love clowns and my whole youth was spent being horrified of clowns and dolls. And now I love dolls. And then Still you love rats. Don't and like ventriloquist love... dummies. Yes. Oh, yeah. And I used to be scared of rats, and now I embrace rats, obviously. Yeah. I love rats. Can, can we see Ramon for a second? This is Ramon. I rescued him from the dog toy section. He's a Aww. dog toy. See? Yeah. Aww. His name is Ramon. He was at Target on the clearance. He section. should meet meet my corgi Izzy. They'll have fun. <laughs> no, this is Ramon. He's my sideshow. He's sideshow rats mascot. <laughs> and yeah, so Velvet has a, a cute corgi. Yes, I do. Oh, yes. cool. Pembroke Welsh Corgi. Very, very cute. Um, black and brown colored. And whenever we go out, everybody has to pet her. Like we stop every 10 feet yeah, for people to pet her. <laughs> Can't really, yeah. She loves it though. She loves it. That's awesome. And you're a cat person. And you have cats, you, right? I'm a cat and a dog person. But okay. I only have cats right now. We, we want to get a dog when we have a yard. Yeah, you know? that's best. Because we yes. live on a second floor. And like I'll open the back door and let the kittens go out on the balcony, you know, mm -hmm. and they'll look at the birds and the squirrels or whatever, you know. But 
a dog's got to have a yard. Going it's a lot of work to take your dog downstairs to walk it and make sure yeah. you get it out there on time and you have to take breaks. It's a lot of work because I had two dogs living in an apartment and it was crazy. It's so much easier now having a house. You're just like, go in the backyard, do your yeah, thing. Yeah. Walking okay, your you dog in. in the rain and snow sucks. <laughs> <laughs> so your idea to wait until you get a yard is the best <laughs> idea i've ever heard <laughs> yeah well holly and i we both work you know long hours so we're thinking you know if we get a house that has like a dog door oh yeah that way you can go out in the backyard you know and, and oh, yeah. much or come in and take a nap whatever you yeah. know whatever he yeah, or she definitely. wants to do you know That's but the, the kittens idea. or we have two full-grown cats and we we rescued them on the set of devil's night what they were itty bitty this is a story Oh yeah, <laughs> itty bitty. You they what? They wandered in the set. They were living like under the uh, the actors trailers, so everybody was like feeding them and stuff. And and I got to the set a couple of days late because I yeah. couldn't come until the weekend because I had school. I was in college, and um, so Holly went a couple of days earlier. And we were talking. We wanted to get a kitten, and she looked online and it said if you get one, you have to get two, so they'll <laughs> give each other company. Sure. So we're like, okay, after this big trip to Georgia for the film. When we get back, we'll go to the shelter and rescue a couple of kittens, Aww. right? And so one day I get in from school, and it's before I go. She goes a couple of days ahead of me, and yeah. Joe Berlinger, Bruce Nofsky, all those people are there. And I get a phone call from her, and she is like, oh, my God, you'll never believe what I found. Two kittens. I said, a kitten, because we're just talking about a kitten. Right. It yeah. had to be a kitten. Yeah. And just like you said, she goes, no, two kittens. I'm like, oh, my God. Get them, and, and so right. and you still have them. Oh yeah, okay. yeah. Okay. And, and we named uh, named the girl Georgia because the state there you yeah. go. Mm -hmm. Georgia. That's Makes where sense. we were at when we found her. And um, Goliath got his name because ever since Holly was a little 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 girl, she's still a little girl, but when she was a little, she's shorty. Yeah. When she was real little, she had a dream that, of a cat, and its name was Goliath. So she's always wanted a cat named Goliath. But in her Aww. dream, he was a big orange cat yeah <laughs> you know for some reason but awesome. he, he, he was just an itty bitty black cat but now he's this giant black cat that's awesome and um, <laughs> um when we were just in bastrop a few weeks ago when mm -hmm. when you and i met i rescued a kitten off the side of the road oh you know Aww. you usually i go to those things and, and it's way out of state somewhere so i'm flown in and somebody comes yeah. picks me up from the airport someone takes me to the hotel someone takes me from the hotel to the convention well this time it's close enough i'm like hey guys i'll i volunteer i'll come pick everybody up from the airport i will drive everyone to the hotel yeah. i will drive everyone from the hotel to the convention please do me the honor and let me do this for y'all yeah. and no, they're like oh nice. cool if you, uh, yeah we would never impose on you mr bowen i'm like dude please mm -hmm. so yeah. i got to be the chauffeur for everybody and um the very last morning, the Sunday morning, I got my crew in, in the Jeep and I don't know, we're stopped at a red light and there's like two vehicles in front of us and I noticed something moving like around the front fender yeah. in, in this vehicle and then like a furry shape and fall out of the fender onto the tire <gasps> oh, God. into the road Whoa. and when it hit the road, it took off running up under a car and I was like, oh my God, a cat and as I was hitting the hazard lights and throwing it in park. Chris mm -hmm. Carball, my, my manager guy, he leaps out. Mm -hmm. I'm right behind him. The other two of the, two of the guys mm -hmm. riding with us leaps out. And next thing I know, I'm like, everybody, please stop, stop. Don't drive. And they're like, oh my God, run him over. <laughs> He's going to carjack us. No, they didn't do that. They were yeah. all real nice. Yeah. And, and everybody was so amazing. And they were like, the cat went under this car. No, it's now it's under that car. And that that joker ran under i think he was like yeah, okay i have to go under every car on this road oh, wow and, and we we had traffic stop for maybe five six minutes <laughs> people were but you got when i finally found the caught the kit and he ran out from under the last car and ran up to the highway where they have like the overpass you know and he went up to the wall and he was there and i got him and when i turned around people were like hanging out of their car windows and clapping and Aww. somebody and, gave and, me a and, towel to so put you him still in have this Oh, yeah. Okay. And, okay. and I named him 13. Okay. So Aww. now we have Georgia, Goliath, and 13. Aww. And, um, <laughs> That's so sweet. So far, uh, uh, we have to keep 13 separate from Georgia and Goliath until yeah. they can acclimate. Because right now, yeah. Georgia, mm -hmm. and they just all hiss at each other. Every time I bring them close, they're like... <laughs> 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 
Yeah, it's and I'm like, time. all right, visitation over with. <laughs> yeah, you couple of, just ease them into it. Yeah, yeah. Hey, a couple other cool events coming up. Okay, this week, our friends Raven Black are opening for Devil Driver at Gas Monkey Live. Oh. That show is Thursday night, and there it is. Devil Driver, Ginger, and Raven Black. They were our guests last week on our show. And, um, yeah, cool bands. All Ooh, good. Tuesday's Guar. And Sorry, Guar, I just remembered. Yeah, but also the Goblin Show is coming up November 2nd, uh, I think is the date, or 4th. 4th. Goblin, and they're performing. The new Suspiria movie is coming out soon, too. We saw a preview for that again. We love Gas Monkey Live. So we have a sponsor. They're called Corpse Factory, and they make corpses. Just kidding. They Aww. sell. They sell amazing horror accessories. Yes. And clothing cool. and action figures and props. Women's clothing and cool dresses and, and men's clothes. Yeah, and men's and I lots have that of dress. figurines and props and etc. All the cool stuff. The Velvet, you gotta check it out. Corpse they were Factory. they were at they were at the Bastrop convention. They had the big huge table full of awesome stuff. Like That's right. They yeah. were there. Like they were there too. Yeah. All the cool stuff, right? Corpse They're yeah. amazing. Yeah, they are. They're wonderful. Corpsefactory.com. Check them out. Also, if you have not, which I'm sure everybody has, you should go see Halloween. That's all I have to say. Mm -hmm. You should check out that new Halloween movie. It was really good. You went and saw I'm going to take Halloween. We're going to go watch it when I yeah. get back. It's, you'll, yeah, it's, now, I was telling you that she cannot do anything supernatural, like a, like you, but she can watch like thriller or, yeah. or slasher suspense. this one's slasher. Yeah. super suspenseful it's or really like good. cerebral she can watch those but anytime there's a ghost or a doll looking at it <laughs> yeah no I'm, <laughs> I'm i'm the same way i'm like this i'm like i want to watch but i'm scared because i know that i'm um, not scared so much it's gonna be later when i'm at when I'm, like he's not home and i'm by myself and i see and hear things and i'm like satan come home which is weird <laughs> you should never say those things satan come home but you know whatever <laughs> Our engineer Ziggy is a stand-up comedian. And oh he wow! He is doing a open mic night tonight. Sweet. Uh, he's doing a uh, yeah. yes, one nostalgia tavern. Uh, the show's going to start about nine. I'm probably going up about uh, nine fifteen. So come on out. Uh, it's a really fun show. Uh, you can catch me most Saturdays uh, also at the Backdoor Comedy Club. Uh, those shows are at eight and ten fifteen. Uh, both shows sold out last night. So call ahead to make your reservation. Heck yeah. Mm -hmm. He's a comedian. I'm a frustrated comedian. <laughs> and my attempts at humor... Is that because you're not funny? Well, yes. yeah. <laughs> that is very much. That's it. But I'm funny at being not funny. No. No, no, no. No, no, no. That's not how no, it works. No, no, no. Uh, Good going, thing we're running out of time. We're going in the back door. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Wait, what? That's where he performs. Back door comedy club. Oh, I can't with you. Oh, okay. Okay, that was... I was like, what? We're how going in the back door? No, we're not. What are oh, you no, 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 no. Back door. I'm scared. Jason, guess what? This magazine is back, and it's now published in Dallas. Sweet. Fangoria. When you were in prison, did you get love letters? Oh, no, oh. no, no, <laughs> no, no. Oh. I did get letters of support of Good. people. Good. Those are love okay. letters. Those are love letters. They're a different kind of love. Yeah, I guess you're right. Yeah, yeah. Oh. It's They're good to get letters love. of support. Um, I, I got tons of letters of support, and... and and that's what gave me hope. How, you know, how much and, does that help your heart? Oh, uh, it helps tremendously. And, and 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 you just and I'll tell you what too. You don't know who else it'll help. Like um, they have what's called property control, so you either have to throw stuff away yeah. or or send it home. Mm -hmm. And so my dad would, would I'd send my mail to my dad, mm -hmm. and one year he got pneumonia real bad. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And depression kind of kicked in because he's, you know, his. his he never got a chance to know me. You know, every time he tried to get to know me, something would happen that would yeah. take me away, mm -hmm. you know, and things. So we didn't ever really get a chance. So he was having one of those woe is me moments, you know, and, mm -hmm. and, and he always respected my privacy, but something, you know, he went in that room where he keeps all my letters and just opened one of the boxes up. And it helped him. And he opened the first letter and it was like, hey, you don't know me, but I believe in you. I support you and I'm yeah. spreading the word for you. And he could not stop reading because for him, he wasn't getting any letters. He wasn't getting any support. The that, community the, was the against thing. him. Right. Too. And your brothers. Yes. Your family and your brothers, they, they don't right. They don't get those letters mm -hmm. of support. They don't yeah. get the crew from New York coming to say, hey, and put an arm around you and say, hey, we're going to do something to help you. Mm -hmm. You're right. It's now, I, I, look, we're running out of time. Very sorry, man. Go ahead, Ziggy. Uh, so how can our listeners and our viewers 
how can they believe and support your organization to help more people that were wrongfully convicted? What's the best way? Monet uh, there, monetary. There are, yeah, definitely many ways. Uh, log on to proclaimjustice.org. There's, we have a button that you can click called Donate Now, and it'll allow you to donate money. And the money goes towards investigation, uh, towards whatever we need to get the case done, uh, hiring attorneys, which we always get a really good deal on, usually at cost or even for free. So a lot of the um, overhead is kept to a bare minimum. Good. Is that what you meant, Ziggy? Uh, yes. Okay. That, 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 is what I, uh, and, and, that is what I meant. Yep. And also, if I can just say one more thing on that, if you are an artist... And that whatever kind of artist you are and you want to do some type of an event to raise awareness, you just don't have the money in your pocket, but you know that people will come in and, and, and pay for a ticket to see your show and you want to have proceeds of that donated to proclaim justice and you want to do some type of an event, please do so. I encourage that because we, we'd for, like as course show to partner on something like this. We that, talked about it. Yes, we yep. did. Yeah. And I would love that. And, and I'll tell you what, that's another thing that would come in letters. You know, people would say, hey, I went to this event for you guys at this place, you know, and, and they were playing bands and, and, and that's talking about your case. So that was a big deal. So if we could do something like that for Proclaim Justice and mm -hmm. for our clients, I know it would go a long way, not just for their morale, but just to help us pay for their defense. You bet. Got it. All right. Man, we're right on uh, 730. So. Thank you, Velvet. Yeah, no thank problem. you, Janie Slash. Thank you. Thank you, Jason Baldwin. Thank you. Thank We're you glad all. you're alive, man. Mm -hmm. We're glad you're here. Thank you for being here. All right. Uh, much love. Thank you guys very much. Uh, next week, we have a great guest called the Erotics, a uh, sleaze metal band from New York. Talk to you. See you next week. Sunday we're here live. We're gonna give you 90 minutes of live, great irreverent shit. <laughs> and also just talk about Satan and talk about movies and talk about metal and talk about Jenny Slash's uh, weekly dose of horror. Yeah, Texas Fight My Weekend. I am here with Dee Wallace. Don't just don't start my boobs all the time. Sure. I do get comments from occasionally religious fanatics. I have seen people yeah. stopping down. Who want to wag their finger at me for a ring tight. The Gold Pain Show Ruler!